Yeah, <laughs> oh yes, I should say yeah. Yeah, thanks for setting the record there. Uh, yeah, uh, many of you know Phil. If you don't know Phil personally, if you've ever read any of his books, as Ben had mentioned earlier, you really get a sense that you know the author when you read the books because he puts such a personal touch to all his books. Uh, in his most recent book, An Acre of Time, Phil talks fondly about his youth in Ottawa. Uh, and then for some reason, he took off to Liverpool in 1962. Uh, maybe that might explain his love for the Beatles. I think they were just getting big at the time. And then he finally returned to Ottawa and has lived in the capital region ever since. Phil is a freelance columnist, or was a freelance columnist for the Ottawa Citizen from 1991 to 2017 and has also written articles for National Geographic Traveler, Equinox, Canadian Geographic, Ottawa Magazine, and Phil has twice won the Ottawa Citizen Nonfiction Award. Now if I can just ask everyone to uh, mute themselves, please. Uh, just, everyone just click their mute button. And he's also won the Leela Common Award for History, which is awarded annually by the Canadian Authors Association. I'll give you more information at the end of the show where you can uh, visit his website and get more information on him. But tonight, as you may know, Phil's going to be talking about a not so controversial topic about the Breton Flats. Well, I, 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 just before we get started, I know we're going to the background. If we can ask everyone to click the mute button. That sounds good. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate that. So with that in mind, uh, we have our top name is Arrested Development, a start-stop history of Le Breton Flats. Would everyone please welcome Phil Jenkins. Hello, everybody. Um, I think I'm going to have to add the VOC after my name is a variant of concern. Sorry about, <laughs> sorry about the technical difficulties of getting in, but uh, here we are now. Um, this is a, an enjoyable experience for me. I'm used to dealing with about three people and Apparently this evening I'll be dealing with about 200. So it's a welcome big conversation. Thank you very much. Um, let's move on to the, uh, the I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is go through a, a slideshow for you uh, and talk. And uh, apparently at the end, we'll have plenty of time for discussion, for back and forth. And here we go with the, uh, the first slide. Let's just, Get that down. Um, here you can see a tourist guide uh, that is um, from the year 1952, which is the year that I came to Ottawa uh, with my, I brought my parents along. And uh, my father had come over to uh, work on the dew line uh, with General Electric. So um, I, I, the first place that we lived in the city was actually out by uh, in Manor Park. And then uh, 10 years later, we moved away uh, from uh, here. My father uh, unfortunately had cancer, wanted to go back to Liverpool, England to, uh, to die. Which did. And then I came back in 1978 on, on what was supposed to be a three month holiday. And I have been here ever since. Um, during the, the, the 80s, um, as I got to know the city, I became curious about this cleared area of Le Breton Flats. And the memory came back to me that we used to cross over there uh, on a streetcar to get over to, uh, to, to Gatineau Park. And um, later on, I was walking down Bronson and I decided that I would try and tell the biography of one acre of land, of one acre of Canada, which now gave me the problem, uh, as you know, Canada, the second largest country in the world, now gave the problems what exactly I should choose for the acre. Um, I, the, the, my girlfriend at the time, her grandmother had uh, grown up there, given birth to 18 children on the Le Breton Flats. And, um, I realized that my actual fascination uh, with Canadian land was that I was interested in the, the evolving Canadian attitude towards land. Um, in a sense, I've always been interested in my writing between the contest between the, the poetic and the financial, which I suppose you will recognize as a, a, a daily occurrence with you, but how did that work out with land? 
how did that work out with land? So I started to research the Breton Flats and, and um, eventually realized that the, uh, I'm just trying to get my slide to move down, just one second. Now that, oh no, it's, I'm very sorry, now, it's, now it seems to be stuck. We had this problem with the previous. Uh, so again, uh, if, for people that do have their video on, uh, last time we asked everyone to turn their video off. There we go. Help there, we go. There, there we go. Yeah, right. that's, that's helped. I, I, that's helped, Richard. Thank you. I've got it now. Um, so I, I started doing my researches. And um, as the story, the, the biography, if you like, the tale of this one acre of Canada, um, I divided it up into four segments. Uh, land when no one was here. Territory when the Algonquin had been here, the, the, the native Canadians. Um, property, which is the, uh, from the French word proper to own. And then finally, real estate, when the British uh, came uh, after 1760, came in control of, of the land. So first of all, We'll go back to the Native American. There you, you can see a drawing of the, uh, of the Algonquins, um, the Kitschisipparini. And uh, the, the one thing to notice, of course, is that they're wearing all natural fibers. So they, they would do fine moving into the glebe. The, um, the, attitude that they carried towards land, if we're looking at the Cana evolving Canadian attitude towards land as occurred on the Breton Flats, is that they, under, they operated under a concept of enough. Um, if one had enough land to feed one's family, extended family, uh, using trap lines, then um, that was sufficient. Uh, of course, we now work on the, uh, the system that the more land you own, um, the the further up the economic ladder you are. And in some cases, um, particularly in England, where I'm from, uh, it's a sign of, of uh, peerage or being further up the hierarchical uh, social scale. But they just simply operated on the idea of enough. Now, when Champlain came through uh, in June 1613, uh, when he came through, he was actually passing the Breton Flats in, in, in two canoes. And in each of those canoes was an Algonquin guide. And had Champlain leaned forward and said to one of those two Algonquin guides, uh, how do you guys do things around here as regards land? Um, I think he would have said that, that, well, we work on a system of enough. I have my trap lines uh, and, um, and there we are now. In Champlain's mind, he's, as he's passing through or past Le Breton Flats, it's now become part of Nouvelle France because that's how colonization works. As you, as you go through an area, whatever's over your left shoulder becomes part of the country that you're from. In the United States, it was Lewis and Clark. So at that point, the, the, that area, the Breton Flats, uh, next to the Chaudière Falls, which uh, Champlain had to uh, uh, portage around, that now becomes part of Nouvelle France. Now, how does that, re how does that reflect uh, later in history? Now, they never actually settled, the French never actually settled on the Breton Flats. And to date, although I'm sure that eventually there will be proof that the existence of um, artifacts or uh, relating to uh, the Algonquins have not yet appeared. Although if you go over to Lac Limi, uh, some of you may have done some time there or some archeological time there over at Lac Limi, there is evidence of, of um, spring camps and, uh, that took place uh, on, on, uh, over by Lac Limi. Uh, but 
the reason I have put Pierre Louis Constant Pensy there is that in the course of my researches over in the um, what was then the Department of Indian Affairs, a name that has uh, fortunately been buried, the I came across a gentleman writing a letter to Sir James Kent saying there are incursions on my trapping territory and these are uh, affecting my hunting and my ability to feed my family. Um, what he was talking about, and he then lays out the area, what he was talking about is where Ottawa is now. Probably about a 10 square mile area for his, uh, for his trap lines. And he's asking Sir James Kemp if it's possible to have land somewhere else. He's not saying, please take them away. He's saying that these incursions on my land are affecting me and can I, affecting my ability to feed my family, can I please have some land somewhere else? And in fact, he was granted some land up at Burnstown. Now, what's happened here is that the idea of colonization has actually displaced him. The incursions were Colonel By with the building of the Rideau Canal inside his hunting territory, inside his trapline territory. So almost right away there, uh, we can see that colonization, uh, th this new uh, uh, attitude towards Canadian land, and in particular to the Breton Flats, and in particular to the acre that I was studying, had caused the displacement of the previous occupants. Um, as I say, the French did not settle there. And then in 1759, uh, there's a battle that takes place on the plains of Abraham, uh, Abraham being the farmer whose plain it was. Um, by about four o'clock in the afternoon, both generals, the French and the English general, uh, are mortally wounded or, or dead. And at that point, um, uh, all the, the trees that had been arbre on the Breton Flats were now trees. The fish that were in the um, Ottawa River, which had previously been poisson, were now fish. And we moved over into the real estate system. Uh, just a little side story there. Um, during, after the, uh, the battle, uh, battle at the Plains of Abraham, uh, the French were uh, uh, sequestered into the citadel there. And everybody was waiting to see which country would be sending um, a reinforcement. And so it was a, trying to see whether the, the, whichever ship came past the Ile d'Orléans, what flag it was flying would determine the future of Canada. Um, had it been a French ship that came around, we'd all be, I'd be speaking to you, je parle maintenant en français à vous. May the, the, what it, it turns out it was the British, but while they were in the citadel, the French, they were starving. They were not being supplied with much food. Um, and at one point, um, one of the, one of the uh, French soldiers came to the captain and asked, said to the captain, we're running short on food. And the captain said, well, what have we got left? And he said, well, we've got some, uh, some cheese curds, some gravy and some French fries. So uh, Captain Poutine asked them to put those, asked him to put all those together. And uh, sorry, bad one, a uh, little bit of a groaner. But um, so after the, after the 1759 battle, it now, Le Brent Flats now became real estate. Uh, one of the things that would happen to it um, is that it would become part of the, the real estate, the British system um, of, uh, rewarding uh, soldiers by giving them land. Um, starting with 200 acres uh, for, say, an infantryman, a grunt, uh, right up to, say, a captain uh, would probably get 600 acres, etc. So the idea that, uh, that there would be slow colonization of the Breton Flats was enhanced by the fact of 
First of all, it was the junction of three rivers. We are actually Trois Rivières, if you think about it. Uh, the Rideau, the Gatineau, and the Ottawa are all meeting, and two waterfalls. Now, the Chaudière waterfall, or as the, the Algonquin would have called it, uh, the uh, Astiku, that, um, that meant that sooner or later, if you look at the model of colonization, of habitation, of, uh, of uh, the eastern woodlands, uh, anywhere there's kinetic water power, there's going to be um, a settlement that's going to evolve. Now, it actually, of course, evolved on the other side with the arrival of Philemon Wright. But here we can see that uh, a gentleman called John Stegman, who was a surveyor um, in 1795, had completed a, a, a survey of Nepean Township and had divided it up into lots using the same as the uh, French seigneurial system. You can see that there's strips of land coming back from the Chaudière and from the islands and from uh, that's, that's Nepean Bay there just above the A, the letter A, that they had that here the, that the, uh, so that everybody gets a bit of waterfront. Now, a gentleman by the name of Robert Randall had come up the river in 1800. He's actually uh, escaping creditors. Um, he had, uh, Robert Randall's an interesting character. He was the first gentleman uh, to be um, uh, accused of trying to bribe Congress, the American Congress. Um, not the last by any means, but certainly uh, the first. And he had been given a choice. He was, he was caught doing it and he was given a choice. You can either go to, to jail or you can go to Canada. So he said, okay, well, I'll, I'll, if you don't mind, I'll go to Canada. Started a business in Niagara Falls. Um, that got him in trouble with creditors. So he came up looking for somewhere to start a new business, possibly pay off his debts. He applied for a grant um, to the surveyor, uh, to, to the office of the surveyor uh, um, in, in Yorktown then for these two lots, 39 and 40. And in fact, he was grant, given a grant to 40. Almost immediately, his credit was caught up with him and he was put into a debtor's jail in Montreal. Uh, the, the two ways you get out of jail, debtor's, debtor's uh, jail then uh, is either first, first, feet first, or you pay off the debt. And fortunately, um, some of the people that were in debtor's prison with him were able to get his release. They got out, were able to raise the money and get him out. When he returned to see what had happened to his lot 40, which is where the acre is that we're discussing an acre of time on the Breton Flats. This is the Breton Flats here on 39 and 40 at the top there. Um, when he got back, he found out that um, in lieu of the, the fees that the lawyer had been charging him and accumulating to hold his grant, um, that the lawyer himself, a gentleman by the name of Bolton, but which you will recognize as a, a street name in Ottawa, uh, that the, the uh, lawyer Bolton had actually seized the land in lieu of the, uh, the payment of, of the legal fees that had accrued. Um, Randall attempted to try and get the land back. He couldn't. Uh, at one point, there was a court case and uh, lawyer Bolton um, took, was there in the court and the judge, the judge's name was also Bolton. And it was actually lawyer Bolton's father um, so, uh, as you can imagine how that one went for Robert Randall, the land, the lawyer Bolton then put the land up for sale and he put the land up for sale, um, to, uh, in a, in a, in a sort of fire sale down in Brockville and a gentleman by the name of John Le Breton bought the land. Uh, he got it for 499 pounds. And he then became, and then uh, uh, that is when it starts to become known as the Breton Flats. What was already down on the Breton Flats when he bought it in 1820? 
Um, there were, for instance, um, this is Colonel By's uh, later drawing of uh, the first tavern. That was pretty well already there. That was probably already there by the time he bought it in 1820. We're not quite sure of the exact dates. Uh, Isaac Firth was the husband of Mar Firth, and this was becoming a stop for the uh, timberman and the, the logging uh, lumberjacks as the logs were being brought down the river. In 1800, Philemon Wright had sent the first log raft down the river, starting the the uh, trade for the, the the timber trade, and this tavern was servicing the gentleman who had to wait for the logs to go over the Shortier Falls and then reassemble them on the other side of the Shortier Falls. Um, here is an 1824 sketch that was done for Lord Dalhousie. Um, um, Lord Dalhousie was attempting to uh, acquire land uh, uh, in order to build the Rideau Canal. Now the question was, where was it going to come out? Where was the Rideau gonna, Canal going to come out? The kind of obvious place to do it would have been above the Shortier Falls. You could have come out of, through Dow's Lake, uh, down the Rideau, down through Dow's Lake and above the Shortier Falls. But John Le Breton actually blocked him because he said that he owned that land and that, and that part of the, uh, the, the shoreline. And therefore, it would have to, uh, he, he would charge Lord Dalhousie 3,000 pounds, having paid 499 pounds for it. So uh, Lord Dalhousie re refused. If you ever get the chance, you should read the letters that went back and forth between Le Breton and Dalhousie. Um, they're wonderfully vitriolic. And the, uh, the, the, I, the, the eventually, and I think you might be able to see that the, the name down here, Sparks. Nicholas Sparks had actually bought most of what is downtown, uh, down now downtown Ottawa, including the, um, the, the, the valley that went down uh, for what is now the, the lock system uh, that goes down, the eight locks that go down uh, past the uh, Bytown Museum there. And Sparks actually gave it to Lord Dalhousie. And that is why the Rideau Canal goes out that way. But uh, had, had Dalhousie not uh, taken umbrage with John the Breton and his attempt to, to flip the land, then uh, it probably would have gone over the Breton Flats. The, the, the entrance might have been there over by the Breton Flats. So again, right away we see um, the, with the, uh, the first of all, the, the, the natives had been usurped from, from the Breton Flats, our, our friend uh, Pierre-Louis Constant Penancy. And now, um, it's been subject to land speculation or land flipping almost right away. Um, so the, in the history of, of, of Canadian land, of course, there's a lot of that. Um, one thing to note, of course, is that it had not, it was never ceded. The, the land was never ceded. We'll, we'll get to that a little later on with, with, uh, with Le Breton, the history of Le Breton Flats. Um, down here, we can also see the name Richmond Landing. And of course, that pertains to, uh, in 1819, the Richmond settlers. Now, these were half pace uh, soldiers, led uh, about 400 of them, in fact, led by Colonel Burke, a uh, Colonel Burke, who had been told to go start a settlement by the name of Richmond um, as a way of establishing militias within the Eastern Woodlands in case the Americans decided after the War of 1812, having lost the War of 1812, if anybody uh, currently uh, watching me uh, is American, uh, I have to, I'm sorry to report to you that in fact you lost the War of 1812. Uh, we won that one. Um, th that the, uh, the, the, 
The British uh, were concerned that the Americans might come again, so they were establishing some militia settlements, and the Richmond was one of them, Perth's another one, and so uh, they actually camped out for a few months, these, these soldiers, they camped out on the Breton Flats, probably took down the first trees from the Breton Flats, although Philemon Wright might have grabbed a few, and then um, a, a small party of them set off to, uh, to, to reach Richmond, the site that had been chosen, and hence the Richmond Road, which pretty well runs along the same way, um, despite the attempts to rename parts of it, that, that it, it runs along the original uh, path that uh, Colonel Burke had taken and it did indeed establish uh, a Richmond. Um, so Colonel By arrives um, on the, uh, 1825. On the first day, um, he's actually standing on the Breton Flats and they're getting ready to, uh, to, to bring supplies over that Philemon Wright is, uh, is supplying them. And um, the, uh, the first, uh, uh, his wife turns the first, Le Breton's wife turns the first sod and away we go with the building of the Rideau Canal. Um, by 1832, that had been completed. And um, the, 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 uh, that's the origin also of Pooley's Bridge, which, as you may know, runs, by, uh, runs from the Breton Flats down the side of the, of the new condos. Um, uh, it's now a, a, uh, only a, a walking bridge, but originally the supplies that were coming over during the building of the, of the Rideau Canal uh, were coming over from uh, uh, Wrightstown and uh, over Pooley's Bridge and then down to the building of, of, the, of the Rideau Canal. Um, by 1832, um, the first steamer has come up uh, the, the Rideau system uh, through, through the, uh, the various locks, the 30 odd locks. And um, now Le Breton is deciding that um, this looks like the, the, uh, the colonization and the growth of what has become to known, what has come to be known as Bytown is developing. And he intends to start selling off lots um, for, uh, on Le Breton flats so he's now divided it up and he wants it to be a, subdiv a subdivision. I'm just gonna to read to you the advert that he put in 1828 in the, uh, in the newspaper. And it's this. The situation is most beautiful and salubrious being on the south side of the Shorty or Foles with the Grand Union Bridge abutting on the center of the front and leading through the main street. It's replete with mill sites. And for commerce, no situation on the Ottawa River can equal it. The subscriber is determined as much as possible to confine his sales to persons of respectability. Now, what he's actually doing there is the equivalent that we now see, um, you know, um, the, the real estate signs or that you'll see on a new division that's going up, um, the uh, sort of, you know, uh, the perfect lifestyle two minutes from downtown, that sort of thing, a village in the city, the, the, the copy ed, uh, writing that goes on with the selling of land and, and uh, of, of selling of lots. Um, as you can see, this bird's eye view around 1850, no parliament buildings yet, um, but the Breton Flats being down around here, now they've got a permanent bridge over it. This is actually the third bridge that they had to build. The first two collapsed. One of them collapsed just after the third chair on the day that they were opening it. Everybody, buddy, hip, hip, hurt, oh. And then went the bridge. But they managed to get one, built a permanent one. So there's development slowly taking place here. Now, what is about to start growing here is the, um, there we can see 
the, the layout of Bytown. So you can see there that it's labeled Le Breton. Notice there's the Sparks Estate, uh, Sandy Hill, the Besser Estate, and Barracks Hill then. Um, down here, having arrived in 1812, uh, Bradish Billings, and uh, McKay has arrived over there. Uh, McKay was one of the major stonemasons on, on, the, uh, on, the, on the building of the Rideau Canal. And the, um, what starts to grow down on the Breton Flats is the timber trade. Um, just a quick note here, and we'll come back to this later. Um, famous people born on the Breton Flats, uh, Thomas Ahern. Um, we'll get to him later, but just note 1855 Thomas Ahern born down on the Breton Flats. There's Booth Sawmills. Gradually, uh, after 1850, after a mayor called John Scott had held an auction for the lots down near the, uh, the, 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 the kinetic water power that was provided by the Chaudière Falls, he, he had actually gone down around Lake George uh, in the States and offered the existing, the extant lumber barons down there that they could come up and bid on the various lots near the Chaudière to start to develop their sawmills and that their bids would not be opposed. And then we have the arrival there of about 23 American lumber barons, people like Thompson, uh, Pearly Patty, etc., who came up and started their sawmills um, while the the the, uh, the forest uh, north of of the Shortier Falls was being clear cut, um, and as you can see, these these are major these are major works. Um, Booth is actually the first major Canadian. Uh, he's from the Eastern Townships, uh, John Rodolphus Booth. Um, is anybody called Rodolphus anymore? I think it's, it's kind of a classy name. But the uh, Booth's sawmills eventually became the largest sawmills down uh, on the Breton Flats, near the Breton Flats. And here, we, there, look at that. That's actually Pearly Patty Mill in the background. But this was like a village of timber. Um, at one point, the sawmills, which by then had become, uh, at their height, were the largest conglomerate of sawmills in the world. At one point, they decided over a 20-hour period to see how much wood they could actually saw and plane. Now, if one end of it was uh, beneath my foot, the other end, if they laid the planks end to end, the, the the other end was in Hyde Park in London. A continuous sort of boardwalk between here and there in 20 hours, an enormous amount of wood coming out of there. Um, several millionaires who would now be billionaires. Uh, and as I say, Booth became the, um, the, 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 the baron, the, the, the lumber baron, the biggest lumber baron. Um, uh, of course, uh, Booth Street. Um, it's 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 a thing in in, in Ottawa that uh, if you if you if you're wealthy or well known or a celebrity, and you die, you become a street, uh, which is what happened to Booth. Um, several buildings that that he had built, um, and his sons. At one point, uh, I got to say he almost made it to a hundred. Um, he. Died in, 18, in 19, 1925. Um, he almost made it to 100 um, and would walk everywhere. He threw out uh, the puck at some of the hockey games. Um, um, and there's a little story about him that I kind of like where eventually he could, he could barely walk. So he borrowed his son's car and driver for the day. He had several appointments, one of which was to actually throw out the puck at a hockey game that night. Um, so at the end of the day, as he steps out of the car, um, the driver has opened the door for him and the driver is sort of humming and hawing and has got his hand out. 
and J.R. Booth wonders why he has his hand out. So he asks him and he says, oh, what, what exactly is it, is it that you require of me? And um, the, the driver says, well, Mr. Lawrence usually gives me a tip, sir. He gives me a little tip at the end of the day. And uh, so J old John Rodolphus says to the, to the driver, well, why don't you get the tip from, uh, from him? Uh, he has a rich father, I don't. Uh, the, the sawmills, as I say, define the town. If I was going to have a, a bumper sticker to describe Ottawa, I would probably say it was from lum lumber to legislation. Um, so the, the height of the lumber period um, is just before the turn of the century. And then on April the 26th, 1900, the Great Fire. It started over in Hull. It's a chimney fire. There's a south wind blowing. So people can see the plumes of smoke and that the fire is coming across the river. It takes out uh, E.B. Eddy's mills. Uh, Booth, Booth has fortunately installed a sprinkler system. So he managed to save his equipment. E.B. Eddy actually went broke two or three times. This is one of them. Um, and by about one o'clock in the afternoon, what we can see in the photograph is taking place. Um, by this point, the fire is consuming homes at such a rate that they're actually imploding. It's looking for oxygen and it's, it's raging through. Um, eventually it gets stopped down by Carling uh, Avenue near, the, near the, where the experimental farm is now. Um, Seven people died that day and 3,000 people were made homeless. And Le Breton Flats was virtually leveled. Um, a lot of the richer people moved out, uh, including the Ahearns and uh, the Bronsons. And the flats uh, for the first time uh, as we will see later, there's a second time, but the first time they're leveled, raised to the ground. Uh, almost immediately money starts pouring in from, including uh, Victoria, uh, Queen Victoria sent, sent money. Uh, they start, immediately they start rebuilding and um, very quickly the, the, the flats uh, become re-inhabited. Um, although it's it's the beginning of the decline of the of the, of the, uh, of the timber tree. By now, of course, uh, from uh, after 1867, Ottawa has become the capital, and the town has uh, been filling with the bureaucrats necessary to run a country. Parliament buildings have been built, um, and the shift of, from lumber over to legislation has has really has really started. Um, if you want to see what the Le Breton Flats uh, looked like, if you go to Lower Lorn Avenue, which is over by the Good Companions, and walk down the street, uh, actually now is a good time to do it because it's full of cherry trees. But if you walk down the street, you'll see the type of housing that was built uh, era. 1901, 1902, 1903, that was built on Le Breton Flats. Now, one of the reasons that Le Breton Flats also developed uh, after the timber trade was that it became a railway hub. There were coal yards down there, um, and there was Broad Street Station, which we can see here. The first one, of course, had, uh, had burnt uh, down in, in the Great Fire, and this was essentially our Union Station. This is, if you came in from Montreal or from Toronto, this is where you would arrive. The, uh, you can see here the streetcar and on the front of it, the words Royal Mail. These are blue uh, Thomas O'Hearn's streetcars. He started the Ottawa Car Company, uh, the Ottawa St uh, Street Railway Company and held on to it until the, uh, uh, until uh, um, uh, 19, 1959, when the last streetcars actually ran through. 
and it was bought by the city of Ottawa. The company was bought by the city of Ottawa and became OC Transpo. But the other thing that Ahern did um, is that he became, he electrified Ottawa. Um, he installed the first electric light bulbs that ran uh, from Rideau Hall uh, down to Parliament. Uh, he was a telegraph operator um, and uh, was involved in some of the first uh, radio transmissions across the Atlantic. Um, the Ottawa Power and Gas, Electric Power and Gas Company um, was his. He, 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 as I say, he electrified. Sooner or later you get a utilities baron and it was, it was, it was Thomas Ahern. Um, I'd love to go more into his story, but of course we've got, only got a limited amount of time there. But if you, if you look up Ahern, it, it, it's an extremely interesting life. He teamed up with a gentleman called Soper. Um, and Ahern and Soper is actually still a, an existing business um, in communications down in, in Ottawa. <laughs> Ahern and Soap used to have a little party trick where they would, um, uh, they'd, have a, they'd be at a gathering and um, Soap would go into the audience and say, take somebody's pocket watch and read the inscription on the back of the pocket watch, keeping it to himself. Ahern is standing at the front and then Ahern would, he would, Soap would say, what does it say on the back of this pocket watch? And Ahern after a moment would say, it says to marry with love. And the crowd would be bedazzled by what they'd done. What they were actually, could, they were both um, telegraph operators. What they were actually doing was winking at each other in Morse code. And that was how they actually pulled off the party tricks. So, <laughs> so there we are. Um, by 1812, Broadseat Station has, has uh, b given way to the Union Station uh, downtown uh, on, on Rideau there. There's an overhead of the flats in, 18, in 1950, an aerial thing. For about 3,000 people living down there. By the way, those of you that, here's the acre. Whoops, sorry. Uh, that was the, the acre, but I don't think I can go backwards. Let's see. Yes. The, the, the acre is down here. Uh, and this building down here is the uh, Duke House, which is the last building that came down in the expropriation. Um, oh, by the way, um, if you see this house here, uh, it's on Lauren Avenue and a uh, famous Canadian from Bonanza, Lauren Green was born there, by the way. I suppose he's the second famous person after Thomas Ahern to be down there. Um, here's here's the, the waterworks. This is the aqueduct that, that, are, that they're going to do up. Um, a very quick, very quick story. I was giving a talk to the, uh, the, the uh, Manatic Hysterical, I beg your pardon, Historical Society, and they, a gentleman stood up at the end of my talk, and clearly in his 80s, probably, and he said, um, when I was a boy, there was an entrance into this under Ottawa Street. There was an entrance that came uh, to, as an intake for the pumping station. This is a pumping station, not a waterworks, the Kiefer pumping station, 1875. And he said, the kids used to play chicken. We would jump into the water. There was a grate here underneath that covered the intake into the pumping station and we were play chicken and he says I was a particularly small skinny boy and so we were playing chicken one day I jumped and I actually got sucked in and he came down in complete darkness by the way they were skinny dipping he came here in complete darkness down here and emerged out here wow. this little naked boy uh, thinking that if he's not careful, he's going to be coming out of everybody's taps later that afternoon, Ottawa taps later that afternoon. A lady in these apartments here sees this little boy. She's actually hanging out the clothes 
and takes one of her husband's shirts, gives it to the little boy, who then walks all the way back and gets his clothes, having survived, right? So he stands up and tells me this story. Of course, I said to him, where were you when I was doing the book, when I was researching the book? And he said, he was nine years old when that happened. And as I said, he was in his 80s now. He said, that's the first time I've ever told that story. And he got a magnificent round of applause from the people that were at the historical society that night. There's the Duke House. What had happened? Why were these buildings coming down? In, in, in 1962, had you been living on the Breton Flats, you would have had a notice appear from the National Capital Commission saying that you had two years in which to move out. The area had been expropriated as part of Jack Bear, a town planner who'd been brought over from France by William Lyon Mackenzie King, who had been brought over uh, to uh, redevelop Ottawa, to turn Ottawa, uh, which had long been Laurier's aspiration, into the Washington of the North. And one of the things that they did, and there was a lot of this actually going on in the 60s, 1960s, including Africville, it was that the slum area was to be cleared. It was an eyesore. So in a sense, if you do, the, the way that you do this, um, it's mass redevelopment uh, of an area, is that you first declared a problem, and it was declared a, sum, a slum area. La Breton Flats was a summit, slum area. Um, but as you can see, it's all, as well as it being a slum area, it's a neighborhood. I mean, by the way, just to orientate you, that's where the war museum is now. So that's considered a slum. There's 3,000 people living down there, but it's considered a slum area. Three quarters of them own their own homes. The majority of them, about 70% uh, were French Canadian. And, but by 1964-5, There's a lovely shot. That's looking down Queen Street West. This is just before it gets knocked down. Cohen and Cohen did the wrecking, the happy wreckers, as they're known. Um, that's the Juliana apartments. And this is the wall that stopped the great fire of 1900 from going downtown. Um, here's some paintings by a gentleman called Ralph Burton, who was commissioned to do some paintings of uh, Le Breton Flats just before it knocked down. If everybody leans forward and puts their ear on these paintings, you can hear bulldozers in the background as, it come, as, as Le Breton Flats comes down. There's another one. The city owns these, by the way, there's 23 of them. Um, places, businesses such as uh, Baker Brothers, uh, Junkyard, the largest uh, junkyard in the city. Um, some of you, some of your fathers or grandfathers may well on a Saturday have loaded up the car uh, with a bunch of junk out of the garage and, uh, and taken it down, down there. Uh, it actually survived and it's over on Sheffield Road now. Um, responsible for a lot of the pollution that was under the Breton Flats, of course. Uh, they had a gas station there. They were burning the covering off copper wire. Um, there was a lot, of, uh, yeah. I took a lot of cleaning up there. Another Ralph Burton. Um, and then there we are by 1966, all gone. Uh, this is the acre, that's Duke Street there. So all gone. And then for the next 40 years, um, all sorts of weird and wonderful schemes. There's, there's the pumping station where and where our little boy would have gone through had he not managed to get out. Uh, the, for the next 40 years, basically, this area sits vacant. 156, sorry, I work in acres. 150, what the heck there is, but the, what the heck a heck there is. But the, that's 156 acres. Parliament is just up here. 
prime real estate in the capital of the country um, that's sitting there. Basically, it's a dispute that goes on, a land dispute that goes on. Again, looking at the Canadian land towards land, um, there's 156 acres waiting to be developed here. Um, and unfortunately, there's three jurisdictions going on. There's the feds, there's the city of Ottawa, and then the regional Carlton, regional Carlton uh, jurisdiction. So I think you'll agree, everybody, that it's a rule that every project costs twice as much and takes twice as long as you originally thought. Well, if you've got two levels of government involved trying to settle it, it'll take four times as long and cost four times as much. If you've got three levels of government trying to decide what to do with that kind of acreage, you're going to have, it's going to take eight times as long cost eight times as much actually how it worked out eventually the ncc gained control i'm just having a look at the time here so eventually the ncc gained control of of that whole area and started um, making plans for it to be developed and they put out this this is the parkway by the way uh, so just over here is the short ear falls the the plans that that came up with the, was originally that uh, the, the Department of Defense would go down there. Um, there was talk at one point of putting an aquarium down there. There was talk at one point of putting. Um, I think we'll all agree Canada needs a high speed train system. That the high speed train terminal would have been. These are a bunch of X files that would have been down here that never actually. Uh, uh, appeared. And finally, uh, it goes out to tender and um, the, to be developed for, uh, for housing. At one point, they wanted to put uh, an affordable housing uh, pr uh, uh, suburb down there. But eventually, the, uh, it, the, it goes out to tender with the NCC. Um, the, the tender... Um, I might get in trouble for this, but I think the tender was rigged so that only one person, one firm could actually win the bid. And it was and uh, that was the, the, re the residential part of it. Originally, it was supposed to be a, a mixture of residential and government buildings, uh, none of which would be higher than five stories. The only government one that's gone in so far is the war museum that opened up in 2005. Um, and that's phase one that the Claridge homes, after that tender, being the only ones that got the tender that, that they built. Now, the, there, there are a large number of, of people in the city, myself included, who are, what's the best word I can use? Disappointed. By, the, by this development down on the Breton Flats. Um, I, don't, I think you'll agree that architecturally it's not particularly stunning. Um, the amount of affordable housing within it, there are some, some affordable housing, uh, certainly not affordable to me, but uh, affordable to, uh, to some people, um, but they have grandfather clauses on them, which means that after 25 years, they can go on the open market. And as far as I know, there is no examples of poor people buying out the rich. Um, so that's phase one. Phase two will be down over here. And just on this, that's where the new line is gonna go. Um, so they go up. The NCC then decides, that, and I went to the meeting in the War Museum that um, probably about, uh, I think you'll remember about five or six years ago, that the, um, uh, the NCC started taking in bids for the developing of the Breton Flats um, as a destination. Now, by now, the Canadian attitude towards land has evolved to the point where we're not building neighborhoods, we're building destinations. So, as you may recall, it boils down to two bids 
for it. Uh, there's rendezvous, which is the illumination rendezvous uh, group, which includes um, the owner of the senators and uh, a large development company. The other bid, uh, the Candanasis, uh, was a couple of billionaires, one of them from Quebec. And we get into the battle of the developers. Um, basically, the, the battle is actually about this, a tale of two stadiums. This stadium, as you can see, it's in the background there. This, as you can see, carries the senator's logo. That one doesn't. This is the rendezvous one. That's the uh, canonesis one. Um, Melnick had been musing about how, moving the, the stadium <coughs> for several years previously. And uh, I think that as pretty well, as soon as he said he wanted to move the stadium downtown, it was a done deal that this bid would win. That bid, the illumination of the Breton would win. And in fact, it did. Um, he, uh, Melnick um, was, was part of that bid um, and he had promised to bring the hockey team downtown and uh, they won the bid. Not too long after they had won the bid, and there was all sorts of wonderful things that were supposed to go on. If you have, I mean, look, yeah. Of course, one of the things you'll notice that there's, there's a lot of condo down there. In fact, they were talking about maybe having 3,000 people living down there, which is exactly the same number of people that were moved off in 1964 and 65. So history is a big wheel turning. But um, the, uh, the, the uh, accommodation that they're providing here is mainly for what I call the sky people. Uh, Ottawa's full of sky people. They're people that live in midair, say on this floor, on the 13th floor. Then they go down, uh, they get in their little metal boxes and they drive for about 25 minutes. And then they go back up an office building downtown and, and spend the working day in midair as well. So they're asleep in midair and they're working in midair. So probably two thirds of their life are actually spent in midair. Uh, so I call them the sky people. So there's a lot of accommodation for the sky people down here. Um, there were destinations. There was talk, talk of a beer museum, <coughs> um, uh, an aviation center. But the main point of it was that the hockey, the hockey team would be down there. Then slowly the cracks appeared in that deal and it started to come apart. Um, had to do with money. Um, and it, it ended up with Melnick suing his own partners. And both of them were suing each other uh, for close to a billion uh, because I think, I, I can't, I, I can speculate, but I don't think Melnick, Melnick was able to raise the money that he thought he was going to be able to raise with the city chipping in. I don't think the city said that we were not prepared to chip in to, to, uh, to help you with this. Um, it's what's called a PPE, a public partnership. Um, the other one in town, had this one gone through, the other one in town, of course, would have been Lansdowne Park. Um, and um, what can I say there? Don't get me started, I think would probably be the best thing to say there in terms of Lansdowne Park. That was our village, that would have been our village green and the handing over of public lands to private developers. And we end up with this. And I think the NCC realized that after that it collapsed, that it had, they'd made a mistake. Um, by the way, I just want to read you this. Um, we're talking about Canadian attitude towards land. Um, when they won the bid, the uh, the Illuminati people, the um, the people with with the stadium Melnick's group. Uh, this is what they put out as being how they would develop it. 
It will be a place that celebrates its past while inspiring a bright future. It will be a place where First Nations culture and spirituality are key, embraced, shared, and celebrated. It will be a place where the traditions of innovation that once enervides the Breton Flats will once again fuel the future of Canada. Like all the Breton Flats of old, it will be a place where all are welcome, all people, all the incomes, all abilities, as it once wants, it will be a creative nexus point through which people, ideas, and creativity will move, both physically via multimodal means and creativity through innovative experiences, businesses, and places. It will once again take its place among the diverse neighborhoods of the national capital. The final piece of a great puzzle, linking, connecting, competing, and completing. One note, when you may notice in every, all those words that I said there, the word community did not actually appear once. Um, after it had fallen apart, the NCC stepped in and um, with the new, with Toby uh, Nussenbaum taking over, um, they have taken control of it and they've divided it up into these five areas. By the way, the new library is going in, going in there. By now the LRT of course uh, was firmly established. And so they've divided it up into uh, five areas. The library being one of them, there's only four here, but the library being one of them. The flats district here, which is mostly residential housing, the aqueduct, uh, district which would um, have agoras on the side of, and, the, and do up the aqueduct um, and there's the pumping station by the way and uh, this would be a sort of entertain a, 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 found a gathering area if you like an agora this area uh, the Albert district along here again housing with a park in there, possibly a stadium of some sort, and then the park district near the river uh, where uh, people living here can go play. Um, they still are using the word destination, but I've noticed more and more in their, um, in their, uh, in their uh, reports on what's gonna happen down there that the word neighborhood is reappearing. So to sum up, um, in 200 years, what was land and then somebody's trap line um, and then became a piece of real estate, the, the town itself of Ottawa has gone from a, a population of zero uh, to a million. And the Canadian attitude towards land has evolved through um, displacement of the natives. Um, the French idea that it was now colonized and it was therefore part of the country that the people who passed through it were from, the French. Then by dint of battle, it becomes part of, of the British attitude towards land, which is real estate. And it's continued to, through the folly of, of, of real estate bidding and up uh, to the point now where the government is attempting to, uh, to take control of it again and to develop it slowly. Um, I remember asking somebody uh, who worked for Claridge Homes, I said, what do you think an acre of Le Breton Flats is worth? And they said, oh, I think it's up around several million now. And I said, well, I think it's also worth a book. And the, the contest that's taken place down there over those 200 years, those two centuries, is really, again, the contest between the poetic and the financial. There's two melody, there's two lines that run under a city and run under real estate. There's the melody line and the bottom line. And in the last, say, decade, or since 2000, what we've seen is the, uh, the triumph of the financial over the poetic. That was once a neighborhood. 
now it's a destination. And I think, having a look at the time, that um, I can bring this talk to a close. I apologize again for the trouble we had at the beginning. I hope I've managed to uh, inform and entertain you over the, uh, over the last hour. And if I may, um, I'm going to finish with a song, uh, if, if that's okay with you. The reason I'm going to finish with a song is, uh, well, because I can. Uh. There's a town by a waterfall where they saw plain all day I'm gonna make a life there you wait and see in old by town in old by town I'm going to take a big sharp axe, shining steel, tempered in the fire. I'll chop them all down, those big dead trees in old by town, in old by town. I found my love, the landlord's daughter. I married my Mary in Notre Dame. I made her home down on the flats in Old By Town, in Old By Town. Thank you, Phil. I'm going to give some applause here Thank you very on behalf much. of everyone. Uh, Thank you, sir. <laughs> I, I noticed there's all sorts of chat that's going on at the moment. So I imagine that's people thanking you for a, a wonderful presentation, as expected. Uh, Phil, do you have the time for just a couple? We got three questions. Do you have time for? Plenty of time. Plenty of questions? time, Richard. Yeah, okay. go right ahead. Yeah, that one here. Uh, when you were in Ottawa, did you live in the Breton Fats? And if so, uh, why did you or your parents choose this area? Um, my father got headhunted on a, on a train uh, between Liverpool and London after finishing his national service. He got headhunted by General Electric uh, and um, to put in the direct early warning line. And so um, he was offered work in Ottawa and that's why we came to Ottawa in, in 1950, 1952. Um, I never lived on the Breton Flats, but as I say, I remember as a kid going over it. It was the idea that there was this, right in the middle of Ottawa, there was this um, 
if you like, a blank slate or a blank canvas on which I could paint the biography of one acre of land, which is what I wanted to do to examine the Canadian attitude towards land, as I said. So that's, that's why, but I never, I never, I went across it as a kid and I used to walk down there uh, a friend of mine used to take his dog for walks down there and uh, we would go together and my curiosity grew as to why this land was was sitting there vacant and, and nothing happening. So that's why the uh, I chose the Breton Flats and that one acre down there. Okay. So you didn't live there, but you chose it. That sounds good. Uh, I David Raymond asked a question. He notes a uh, poet, Charles Sangster, uh, wrote a poem describing the energy of Chaudière Falls. Uh, Phil, have you ever come across any stories of Sankster visiting Ottawa in the 1850s? No, I haven't. No, I, I, I'm, I'm actually going to, I'm going to make a note of that. Charles Sankster. Yes, I've heard the name, but I don't know the poem. Uh, uh, another question from uh, Paul Morissette. Uh, when the NCC decided to expropriate the folks who lived on the Lebanon flat, uh, why did they not consult with the city of Ottawa first to make sure they could also on the streets. I'm not sure what that means. You understand? Um, yeah, that, I understand what he's saying. Yeah, that he's 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 referring back to my idea of the three levels of government getting getting involved. Um, the the it emerged sort of afterwards that the uh, that they were supposed to there was supposed to be joint control of it through the city of Ottawa. And it would be apportioned out. But Grebert's plan, which Mackenzie, which came out in 1950, Grebert's plan was to treat it as a um, as a national area, federal area, and Mackenzie King backed him on that. And the uh, I think there was actually then it was the Na the National Capital Commission was the was the was a was the federal district that uh, Mackenzie King had basically promoted to turn Ottawa, as I say, into the sort of Washington of the North and to clean it up. And um, at one point it, it emerged that the city had control of the sidewalks uh, of the streets, but the National Capital Commission had control of the sidewalks. I mean, it was crazy. Um, Partly due to the haphazard nature, nature in which the Le Breton Flats had arisen. And um, it took them, as I say, it took them close to three and a half decades to actually sort out control of it. There was a lot of land swapping, etc. But the, the NCC were handed, were handed the job of the expropriation. Uh, so the letters that everybody received uh, in, in 62 uh, were from the NCC. They were handed because I, the city of Ottawa could not expropriate. Nobody owns, actually owns the land that they're on. Um, in terms of war or development, um, you can be expropriated. You own the surface, you don't even own the mineral rights underneath it. Mm -hmm. But the um, you, you, expropriation can take place um, if there is redevelopment going on. And the, the feds were the ones that could do that. They could expropriate. That's why th th there wasn't really negotiation with the city. I'm sure they were informed as to what was going on. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, by the way, who was the mayor at the time? It was Charlotte Witten mm -hmm. at the time. So uh, I don't think Charlotte and the NCC were particularly... <laughs> she wasn't amicable towards men telling her what to do, Charlotte Witten, that's for sure. Yes. we got one last question for you here. I, I love this one the last because I think you can sink your teeth into this one. Uh, <laughs> if not demolished, do you think the Breton Flats would have evolved into a different sort of neighborhood? Oh, that, uh, I love that yeah. question. I love that question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, if you have a look, as I mentioned earlier, um, the other side of Albert Street, um, the houses there are what was on the Breton Flats, particularly Lower Lorne Avenue. If you go have a look, but the houses are in, in what I call the tree streets, Poplar and Willow and those, um, those houses are the same houses that were built uh, after the Great Fire. 
And that picture that I had of the kids playing on the street there um, in, in the early 60s before it, it was taken down, I think it would have slowly gentrified. Kind of what happened in, in Mechanicsville as well. Mechanicsville, of course, is named because the railway mechanics originally uh, built their homes there and lived there. That's why it's called Mechanicsville. But I think that the, um, that, um, for, for instance, I think it would have become an artistic community. There would have been a lot of um, industrial lofts down there that would have, that would have I would have, I think the, the uh, bit like Granville Island almost, I mean, the Britain Flats, in a sense, is an island uh, because of the aqueduct and then the, 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 the cut that runs down to the cliff heating house. It's kind of like a large dinner plate. And I think like Granville Island, it would have become the theater district. Um, what's going on now with, with Zibby uh, probably wouldn't have taken place either as those old buildings were done up. Um, it would have become a funky area, a gas towny sort of area. Um, and um, you would have had to leave it alone. But um, uh, I, I think I, what I can say is the suits won, uh, as opposed to the overalls, the suits won down there. And it was declared, once you declared it a slum, it was gone, you know? But it wasn't a slum, it was a neighborhood, you know? Yeah, there's a, there's a park right next to me uh, that had a, lo a few lovely old homes in it that got torn down in the 60s. The land was expropriated by the city and got torn down. And recently there's been a lot of vandalism in this park. And people are suggesting, yeah. oh, yeah, we should have done, we should put some homes up in that area so there's eyes on the park. And of course the response was, well, there were homes there <laughs> you know, 40 years ago that were torn down. There were no hindsight. Uh, yeah. It's frustrating. I think, red I, flats. Go ahead. I agree. I think when I came back in 78 as an aspiring uh, writer musician, um, had it been left alone, that's probably where I would have gone. You know, some funky bars down there, um, the, the crossover to Hull, uh, et cetera, you know, that, uh, that there would have been a lot of bed sits down there. Uh, and I think it would have been a com become a cultural district. Uh, cultural district neighborhood rather than a destination yeah. which is what it seems to be doomed to become yeah. and a condo forest and it might someday but it won't have the yeah. trip that it would have had anyways thanks yeah i mean i'm glad oh, go ahead i'm glad the library's going down i'm sorry i'm glad that the library is going down oh yeah yeah i think a lot of people are a, a large cultural component down there as well we shall wait and see. I'm not sure that I will um, be around when it finally becomes whatever it's supposed to become, you know? Oh, I, ho I hope not. I, I think you'll still be around. <laughs> At least we hope so. Uh, I'm just I, 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 no, go ahead. I'll be, st I'll be standing in the middle of it. I'll be standing in the middle of it, ranting about it, and people will be pointing <laughs> out, okay, oh, that's, oh, that, it's that, that's that guy. He thinks he's the mayor of the Breton Flats and he's, he's always going on about what happened to it and all. claims he wrote a book about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> like you say, I, I hope you'll still be around, but I'll, maybe I'll end up saying, like you said of G.R. Booth in Ottawa, once you die, they name the street after you. And yeah, so, well, okay. And, <laughs> sure, I'll, I'll, take, I'll take that. I'll yeah, take see, that. I'm hoping long time, I'm talking long time into the future, Phil, not, not something you have to get to right away. But hopefully someday, if they ever do put streets back into a Breton and turn into community today, I'm hoping we'll have a Jenkins Street. In oh, that. thank you, Richard. Yeah. That, that's, <laughs> really that's very kind of uh, Yeah, so I want to thank Phil you for the wonderful talk. How's that? Phil, you've been such a, uh, you're always so generous with the, uh, with the Historical Society of Ottawa with your time, and I'm sure we can count on you again to be a speaker. Uh, in the meantime, just to be close off, I want to, I was short on my introduction, so I do want to urge people uh, to go to uh, Phil's website, which is philjenkins.ca. Just like his name, all one word, P-H-I-L-J-E-N-K-I-N-S dot C-A. And go to his website and you can uh, read more about his books and you can hear more of his music. So I urge you to check that website out, philjenkins.ca. Thank you again, Phil, so much. And Thank that's you, my one last announcement before we go. 
Uh, our next speaker in two weeks, April 28th, will be Dorothy Phillips, another familiar face for HSO people, uh, author of Victor and Evie, British uh, Aristocrats in Wartime Rideau Hall. That's Wednesday, April 28th at 7 o'clock. Don't forget to visit our website to register for that. Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I certainly did. And we'll see you in two weeks. Thank you.